Racing is a passion for most F1 drivers from a young age, but there is the occasional exception. I hadn't even sat in a racing car. I didn't know what a racing car was. My father was a GP. I had no family background in it at all. There are two Williamses in the race because Jonathan Palmer's having his debut outing in the third Williams. Having qualified as a doctor, Jonathan Palmer was one of the most unlikely people to end up on the F1 grid. But for someone who didn't come from a racing family, Palmer sure had a winning instinct. In 1981, he became the British Formula 3 champion, all the more impressive given how he funded his season. I resorted to things like selling stickers. I said, I'm backing a future British Formula 1 star, Jonathan Palmer. And I sold for a pound each, like three and a half thousand of those through Autosport. So that got me through another race. More junior success followed before he made his F1 debut at Brands Hatch. Ultimately, the podium eluded Palmer during his time in Formula 1, but he scored points and he became colleagues with one of the greatest of all time, triple world champion Ayrton Senna. I never really saw Ayrton completely relaxed letting his hair down. I'd only see him around race meetings. We'd often talk helicopters, but he was always pretty intense. And I think even when he was away from the car, he was still, because he was at the track, was pretty serious. I mean, he on flights going to Grand Prix, and he'd be reading the Bible. Hello, I'm Tom Clarkson, and in this episode of F1 Beyond the Grid, I'm chatting to one of the sport's more unlikely stars. Jonathan Palmer qualified as a doctor, just like his father. Formula One was not the career path he expected to take, but sometimes raw passion for motorsport is a potent enough thing to create an opportunity. And after realizing he couldn't race and practice medicine at the same time, Palmer took a sabbatical and focused on Formula Three. He didn't always have a long-term plan or long-term funding for that matter, but he managed to find a way to the top with Williams handing him his F1 debut in the European Grand Prix at Brands Hatch in 1983. Palmer drove for the Ram and Zack Speed teams in the next couple of seasons, but his three years with Tyrrell was his most successful stint in F1. He secured a career-best fourth at the Australian Grand Prix in 1987, and he became F1's only Class B champion that same year, winning the one-off Jim Clark Trophy for drivers using non-turbocharged cars. We look back on Palmer's unique route from medicine to motor racing, some memorable drives for Tyrrell, and why the arrival of French sensation Jean Alesi effectively ended his career. Palmer also offers intriguing insight into working alongside Senna as a test driver for McLaren in 1990. He also became part of the BBC's Formula One coverage after he retired from driving and he remembers working on the day that Senna lost his life at Imola. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Jonathan, thank you for coming on the show. It's great to see you. Well, it's nice to, nice to have you here, Tom, and it's always, it's always nice to reminisce with people that understand motorsport. Well, let's do just that. 83 starts in Formula One from 1983 to 89. Best result of fourth at Adelaide in 87. How do you reflect on your time at the top echelon? That's a very big question. I think, first of all, it was a really, really important, probably the most defining time in a way in my life in that uh, I think with any of us who've been motor racing, particularly at Formula One level, one knows exactly what you're doing at any given year. If you mention, you know, 89, 83, 84, years come into sharp focus, I suppose because you're changing teams quite often or there's a different, or there's always a new car and things like that. Whereas if you ask me what I was doing in 2006 or 2014, I'd really find it hard to sort of define what actually I was doing that particular year. So that's one thing that it's, it is very much still in the spotlight mentally. And in terms of sort of earning money and as a, as a business career or, you know, sort of financial stability, Formula One wasn't a great time. It wasn't a bad time. So it wasn't, it wasn't particularly important from that point of view. But of course, it, it was important in that it was a, one hell of an ambition that any driver, me included, had. You know, you're coming up through Formula Ford, Formula Three, Formula Two in those days, Formula One. And, and you know, it's where you wanted to be and, and the effort that... Well, certainly I went to, and I know that, you know, contemporaries of mine, you know, whether it's Derek Warwick, Martin Brundle, I think we know it was just so much the most important thing in our lives, as it is, I'm sure, exactly the same way to the George Russells and 
Lando Norris is coming up now. But to actually get there uh, was amazing. And of course, it was pretty precarious trying to stay there. And it was always this balance. You wanted to try and do the best job you could, but hope that that was good enough for you to end up staying there. And I did for six years. I'm proud that I got to Formula One. I'm proud that I did six years of it with reasonable level of success, I would say. I was not an Ayrton Senna or an Alain Prost, but nevertheless, I think the most important thing for me and indeed for anybody in their lives is that I gave it my best shot. I'm satisfied with that. I could not have tried harder to be successful with the level of talent I had in Formula One. And the results that I got overall were probably pretty much the sort of results my talent justified, really. Yes, if I'd got into a Williams or McLaren, I'm sure I could have won the odd Grand Prix. But would I won the World Championship against the likes of Senna? No. Well, you say you weren't a Senna or a Prost, but you had a stellar junior career, British Formula 3 champion, European Formula 2 champion. With that kind of CV, did it frustrate you that you didn't get a chance in a front-running Williams or a front-running McLaren? It didn't frustrate me as much as one might have thought, I think, really. And I don't quite know why not. But I think, I'd, I suppose that always coming up through, I was sort of desperate to get to Formula One and desperate to win at every level. But at the same time, I was always pretty realistic, you know, always knew that uh, there's a lot of other good guys out there. And of course, winning in Formula Three, I won in Britain, but um, admittedly, probably half the field were, were overseas drivers. And British Formula Three, when I was doing it, was very much the place to be. In Formula Two, I definitely had a car advantage with Raul Honda, certainly in the second year. But on the other hand, I also had a good teammate with Mike Thackwell, who I beat pretty well too. So, you know, I, I, I certainly deserve to get into Formula One. But I, I think perhaps the other thing is that because I inevitably got into Formula One, the gap between the back end teams and the front teams in my day was so big that it was almost impossible to make any kind of impression. I remember looking back through the grids for Grand Prix when I started my first full year in 1984, and the gap between front and the back and the front, let's say it was Alain Prost in a McLaren or something, and me and my Ram with Philippe Alio was about 10 seconds a lap. You know, this is like being with a, with a kind of Formula 2 car in a Formula 1 race. And people discounted what you did. I think that's another thing with, with those days. It's quite hard to make an impression at a back-end team because you were so far off the pace. OK, but did you get close to a front-running car? And I want to point you towards 87. Certainly it was reported at the time that you were having discussions with Ron Dennis at McLaren to replace the retiring Keke Rosberg. Yeah, I, I had a few times, actually, when I got very close, but just fate didn't go my way. The first, actually, was back in 1982, my first full year of Formula 2. I'd won the British Formula 3 Championship in 1981. I'd test drives with McLaren, Williams and Lotus that autumn, joined route honda for formula two but also was test driver for williams and got on really well with patrick head and uh, frank williams and that was great because i was getting mileage in the car and that was really before test drivers uh, were really the sort of thing that teams had i was pretty much one of the first serious test drivers i think for a team and then i remember start of 1982 formula one season carlos reutemann was driving for williams and he suddenly wanted to stop this was, a, I think, a second or third race of the year. And Frank Williams came down to Thruxton and sat in the car with Ron Torinac to discuss me. And was I ready to make the jump into Formula One to replace Carlos Reutemann? Were you ready? I think I could have been, to be honest. But the problem then was that we had Bridgestone tyres on the route at the time, which were the degradation was pretty high. So you could qualify well, but the performance dropped off very quickly in the race. But because it was new at that time, I don't think Ron Toronak and other people around really appreciated how much degradation there really was with the Bridgestone tyres at that time in a race situation, and therefore how much it compromised the performance of the drivers in the cars. And so I think that's why I think sort of Ron said, look, yeah, he's quick, he's talented, he's bright. You know, he needs more experience, racecraft and things, because the, the few races I had done were just totally blighted by high degradation. So that was the first one. So as a result, then Frank took Derek Daly instead of me. And just imagine if you'd had the Michelin tyres that you got in Formula 2 the following year. That might have made the difference when Frank was at Thruxton. Absol it's on those tiny things, isn't it? Absolutely. And then actually, thinking about it, even before that... 
when I won the British Formula 3 Championship, I had a, a, the prize of, because it was Marlborough sponsored, of a test in the MP4 with McLaren. And the test was at Silverstone. I had a full day on the first day. I did a very good job. The car suited me very well. Ron Dennis was engineering me. I set a time that would have put me on the second row of the grid for the British Grand Prix. And after that test, Ron said, right, I want you to come down and meet John Barnard. He said, look, jump in the car with me. We'll drive back down to Woking. So that evening, I was talking to Ron and, 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 uh, and John in quite some depth. And subsequently, I understood that they were looking very seriously whether to put me in the car for next year. But as it happened, Nicky Lauda came out of retirement. And um, that was the end of that one. God, so close. But what about and the then, 87 chance? Yeah, the 87. Well, I, you know, that's the time when um, I'd won the normally aspirated championship in Formula One. And um, I was pushing everywhere. And I don't know how seriously... Um, I was being looked at by McLaren, you know, nothing for Ron to look at, really. But, um, yeah, there were, there were a few times when potential Formula One drives could have been game changers. And actually, when I stopped Formula One in, or when I, when I last, my last year of racing in 1989, part of the reason for joining McLaren as their test driver in a pretty intensive capacity was that uh, I just, you know, I hope that this could be my chance if Senna or Berger, who were the race drivers, had a problem you know, broken arm or something, and I could jump in the car and suddenly get a result in a, in a top running car. That was the kind of, albeit remote chance, but that was the chance of really launching myself into a way of uh, getting into a top car. But um, I, th I just remember there was a chance I was going to get in the car at Monaco, which I think would have been great. So I, was, I always used to love Monaco. Let's talk about your year of years, 87 with Tyrrell, your best season. Can you tell us, first of all, about that experience of racing for Tyrrell, for Uncle Ken? I suppose the first thing is that the circumstances were quite curious, really, because at the end of 1983, I'd won the British Formula 2 Championship. I was testing with Williams. Frank and Patrick gave me as a, as a reward. I mean, can you imagine this now? But a third car at the Grand Prix of Europe. So I was alongside um, Keki Rosberg and Jacques Lafitte having my first ever Grand Prix at Brands Hatch in September 1983. And God, I mean, it was it was huge. Formula 2 at those days didn't race at Formula 1 circuits. To launch into the crowd at Brands was massive. And um, of course, there's a lot of focus on me as this, you know, the young driver. Now, as it happened, I out-qualified Jack Lafitte, actually. But it, because we, this was in the days when Williams had the Cosworth normally aspirated engine, when the front runners all had turbos in the second half of the grid. Keki, I think, qualified 13th. I was 25th. Jack didn't make the cut. Alboreto was 26th. So Jack probably wasn't very pleased with me. It was pretty tough with those cars because the tyres were all based around the heavier, more powerful turbo cars. The compound was very hard to get any kind of grip out of them. You had to really chuck the cars around to abuse the tyres to get some heat into them. And of course, Keke's aggressive driving style was perfect for that. And that's what got him up the grid. But for Jacques, who was neater and more precise, and frankly, me too, you know, it was particularly hard. Of course, it was, it was a pretty hard first Grand Prix. And actually, interesting, those tyres were so hard that in the race, we, we pit-stopped. But we pit-stopped for fuel, not tyres. Get the same set of tyres on, because you never get the heat into them. How much preparation time did you get? Well, I'd been testing, of course, with the cars throughout the year. So, I, you know, I had, a, I had a little bit of running. I didn't run at brands before. But no, it was an amazing thing. I was absolutely thrilled to do it. The next year of 84, I was desperate to get into Formula One. And one of the drives that the drive I really wanted was the Tyrrell drive. I knew that Ken, through his links to Jackie Stewart and Jackie's link to Martin, Martin was very much the guy that was being pushed forward for that Tyrrell seat. And I was banging on to Ken saying, look, you know, I've won not only Formula Three. I mean, Martin's been second in Formula Three. I know I've won the championship and I've won Formula Two. Come on, you know, you've got to give me the drive, not Martin. And I remember saying to Ken, you know, one time, look, no, can you tell me, have you actually given the drive to Martin? No, no, I know, no, 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 and I'm sure he had. So I was slightly irked when Martin got the drive at Tyrrell, and I didn't. And I, but I, I salvaged together a deal to get myself into the Ram with John McDonald, which I, John was really helpful, you know. But so then I had a year with Ram, which was a pretty dreadful car. I said it was 10 seconds off the pace of the front row of a Guinea grid. Second year, then I got picked up by, uh, there's a new German team starting and looking for a driver. And Andrew Marriott actually put me into that drive. He suggested my name to Eric Zakowski. Of so, Zach Speed. Of Zach Speed. So um, I got the Zach Speed drive. And that, that was a big game changer because then I actually I got paid. I got paid £50,000 a year to drive for Zach Speed, which was a lot better than taking money to Rams. That was another whole story. On paper, the results weren't great at either Ram or Zach Speed, but 
did you feel Zach Speed was more of a Formula One team than Ram was? Because they were doing everything in house, sort of. Well, I don't know whether that makes them more of a Formula One team or not, really. They were desperately enthusiastic. But that first year, we just did the European Grand Prix. We didn't do the flyaways. And of course, there's no teammate as well. You were very much sort of working in a vacuum, really. There was no reference point. And they were. I mean, she said they were trying to do a Ferrari of building the engine, the gearbox, the chassis, the whole thing. And anyway, they kept me on. But it was such a technical challenge, too. I remember testing at Imola. A couple of things sort of stand out from that year at Zaxby. But I mean, Eric Sikorsky was, he, he was obviously desperate for the thing to work and for results and desperate to make it, you know, it to look good, too. He got this German cigarette sponsor, West. So I, I, I remember the first sort of test we were doing. We, you know, these were obviously turbo cars, 1500cc turbo. I remember at Imola, and I was keeping up with Lafitte and Ligier with a Renault V6 and a, for a few laps. And um, I don't know what the boost was, but and then as the engine wore its valves out, literally, I was losing sort of three or four tenths a second a lap until by lap 10, the engine had virtually expired. But these things were just so fragile. Um, and the technical challenge that Zach Speed had embarked on was, was so big. But, you know, they persevered and we got engines that lasted longer and longer. I think one of my greatest achievements was actually it was um, it was qualifying 19th and getting getting on the grid at Monaco, which was one hell of an achievement, really. I think you were a Monaco specialist as well. I was actually. Yeah, yeah I used to love Monaco. <laughs> but also I was, you know, a lot of my success um, or an important part of my success, I should say, in, in any, whether it's Formula 3, 2 and 1 and Group C, was not just trying to drive fast, but make the car quick driving the engineers and the designers to make the car quick and get it in the right configuration, which was frankly going to make a far bigger difference than how quick I or anybody else drove, was clearly the most important thing. Eric would always want, he was a very good friend of Paul Rocher's from BMW and his engine was pretty much modeled on a Paul Rocher BMW. They, you know, an awful lot of beer was drunk in the evenings. Eric would come in like a mad professor with some latest great idea that we had to do to make the car quick. I mean, we had two turbos on the thing at one time on a four cylinder and, and he always wanted to put a bigger turbo on because that meant it would get a thousand horsepower. Whereas the, there was a thing called a K36 big turbo that had about a thousand horsepower. Whereas the K33 smaller one would only have 930 or 40. But, I, you know, had, the big one had no response. So I, I'd be battling with Eric Zukowski saying, like at Monaco, we can't run the K36. We're going to be nowhere. It's about response. You know, we're only on full throttle, Eric, for 27% of the lap or something or whatever it was. So we worked pretty well together. And that's a bit of a theme to a lot of my drives, really. But, you know, with other things, I remember in Austria, the first year, he wanted to make an impression again. And, and we honestly, we started the car with half a tank of fuel. In those days, getting the cars to the end on the fuel was difficult. I mean, they used a lot of fuel, 240 litres of fuel, I mean, 200 kilos of fuel in the car to start with. There was, this is not refueling, but they, they were like, it's like driving a 40-ton truck with it, or a car, I put it at least in the car with a roof rack on lumbering around. But Eric said, no, 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 we're, we're starting with 120 kilos. I said, Eric, we've got no chance. And then no, they said, okay, we have to, we have to go fast, Jonathan, we have to go, we have to, we, we need speed, we have speed. I said, okay. So, you know, I sit in this car knowing that it was going to expire when we had the inevitable electrical problem by lap 27. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, this, this, this was, you know, he had to try and keep starts... the money coming in. I mean, this was, this sort of story is throughout Formula One, particularly in, you know, it's probably around these days too, but in those days it was rife. It was a lot, you know, it was a lot cruder. So, you know, two years of Zach Speed and then Ken tended to keep his drivers for three years on three-year contracts. So at the end of the third year, Martin was going to leave. Martin wanted to go to Zaxby. I wasn't quite, ever quite sure why. And I, you know, I was thrilled to go to Tyrrell. I mean, the idea for me after three years of, of delicate turbo cars that weren't that rewarding to drive, they had a lot of power, but you know, they were unreliable and laggy. The idea of you know, when I jumped in the Tyrrell and a, and a normally aspirated engine was something I jumped at. So we'd literally swap and um, I jumped in the Tyrrell. And it was definitely, it was a much better deal for me. And of course, that was the time when we're in the transition that Formula One was moving away from turbos to normally aspirated engines. So there was this subclass. 
Tell us about the mentality of going into a race against the turbo cars when you know you've got no chance of winning the race. What were your goals? The goal was to be the best of the normally aspirated class. As I say, normally it was, I think there might have been seven cars on one event, but it was generally six cars. And to beat my teammate, like anything else. You know, that's the key thing. If you beat your teammate and I won the class, then that for me was as good as a win I could get. But having said that, it was always nice and very rewarding to get up as far as you feel you could. And one of the, one of the good things, if you like, about the turbos in those days, they were still pretty unreliable. So if you kept going round and round, even if you might have been going two or three seconds slower a lap than the turbos, half a dozen of them, eight of them, were going to expire in the race. So it's a question of how far you, you, know, you found yourself moving up the order. So fifth at Monaco, fifth at Hockenheim, fourth at Adelaide. Yeah, I think the Monaco results were very much on merit. The frantic nature of Monaco meant that I couldn't overthink it. And negative for me was that because I was very, a very sort of analytical sort of driver, the long circuits like Monza was just not my sort of place because I'd, I'd sit there down these endless straights just trying to think how I was going to break at 87.3 metres when I needed to to get into the, you know, the Ascari chicane or whatever it was. And, I, and I'd sort of overthink it. Whereas at Monaco, there's no time to do that. It's just one frantic blur of activity. Up the box, down the box, this, right there, curb sliding, you know, nudging the barriers. It was just a, literally a frantic blur of activity. And I didn't get time to overthink it. And I think that's why I just completely get into another mindset and, and, and did very well. And certainly fifth in 87 was a great result. And you know, in, in many ways, and actually getting the car set up well for the race was really important then. We, we did a, with Brian Lyles, my engineer, who I got on really well with. We worked very well together. We actually came up with a setup of, to make the thing very, very drivable and predictable. And also retaining good braking under the undulations of curbs and road cambers. We, we tried a radical setup of disconnecting the front anti-roll bar so we had no front anti-roll bar at all on the Tyrrell that year, but had very stiff, well, relatively stiff springs. So the, the roll stiffness came from the springs, but at least we didn't lift wheels up and things, and it kept the pitch change under control. That definitely helped me on the way to fifth. And then this, the following year was quite funny, actually, because in 1988, the 0117 Tyrrell, which I sh teammate with Julian Bailey, it was, it was a bit of a dog, really. It was much narrower than the bulky. You know, it looked better. It looked trimmer than the bulky 016, DG 016. But it didn't really perform. It was obviously not very good aerodynamically. Anyway, we used to go to quite on Tenoir, the little French circuit, to test the setup. And we had a short wheelbase version, a long wheelbase version. And we, we decided that the short wheelbase version, as you might expect, was the one to run at Monaco. So we duly went down to Monaco and Julie and Bailey were pounding around and we were running kind of, I think I was about P14, 15, 16. Julian was struggling to get out of the, you know, 26 or something. And then the, my, my car had a gearbox problem and I had to take the spare car for qualifying. And the spare car was in the long wheelbase configuration as well. But actually, it was a revelation. I qualified ninth. It had much better front end. The weight around Monaco, the weight distribution worked better for it. And um, I qualified ninth and finished the Grand Prix in fifth. So it was one hell of a result. What a great story too. Yeah, I, you know, those, those sort of things when sort of pulling something out of yeah. the hat. And uh, I don't think it's really important is not to get psychologically bashed by things going wrong. It would have been easy to get in a complete... Spinner thinking, right, that's it. Now I've got to be in the long wheelbase car, and that's no chance. I'm out of it, and you know, and and and, and had a complete paddy and not driven well. But um, anyway, that transformed. And another one like it actually, in 1989, the following year, when we had the Tyrrell car was suddenly boosted massively in the team by the introduction of Harvey Postlethwaite and Jean Claude Migio. Basically, Harvey and Jean Claude Migio came from Ferrari. And the 89 car was a much nicer car. It was quite radical. It was a low nose in 89. It went to 90, it went to high nose. But it was a very aerodynamically, it was a, I mean, I want the car now, you know, it's, God, it's a, it, anyone who drove a, jumped out of a current Formula One car would be horrified at how compact the cockpits were. No, uh, no head protection, let alone a halo with about eight millimeters thick composite around you and you're belting down the road at, you know, 200 miles an hour in it. But um, anyway. Was that 89 Tyrrell, the, the Migio Pothelswaite car, was that the best Formula One car you raced? Yeah, I, I guess it was really. There's an interesting story on that because the car was late. And the first Grand Prix at Rio, Michele Alberetto, who was my teammate, and I, we had the old 017, which, because we were back at the grid, back of the field. I mean, it, it would have been back of the field in 88, let alone when everyone else has moved on a bit in 89. 
So then we came to the second Grand Prix, uh, Imola, and Michele now got the new. He got, inevitably, as the ex-Ferrari star driver, he got the 018 new car. The, I would say the 018, it was aerodynamically far better, a much, really nice-looking car, but it had gone quite radically to a monoshock sort of uh, front suspension assembly when basically the both front wheels moved up and down together. They were sort of tied together, which uh, Jean-Claude Mugier and Harvey thought was the way to go. And it did indeed. That was a fad for a while. Anyway, we were doing the pra- going through the practice sessions and qualifying at uh, Imola, and it was the first time out for the car. And Michele, he was complaining bitterly about it being far too, you know, oversteer everywhere and, you know, and it was possible to drive and uh, anyway i qualified 25th and michaeli didn't qualify he was 27th or 8th or something and he didn't make the cut for the race so god i mean it was the mood in the tyrol garage was was grim ken had spent big bucks he didn't have getting in harvey jean-claude Mugier and alberetto and there's little old me in the old car that's qualified and in the new swanky car he just hadn't made it after two days of practice and qualifying ken said look no, we've got to try and make this thing work. Will you jump in the new car for the race? You know, I hadn't driven it before. So this was end of qualifying on Saturday. And I said, yeah, sure. You know, because again, I'm always, want, A, I always wanted to do the best job for the team and help the team. And if it was Ken's idea, then I'd do it. And if they all wanted me to do it, fine, I'd jump in it. But also the reality was I wasn't going to get anywhere in the old car. I was going to be plodding around at the back of the field trying to make the best of it. In those days, they had there was a warm up, a thirty minute warm up that we had. So I first time I jumped in the car was for the warm up when it was on you know two thirds tanks or something. We it wasn't refueling in those days. So I went out and I said, "Look, you know, we put the setup on where McCady's left it, but he said it's very pointy." So I went, I went, I went around and three or four laps, and I came in. I said, "No, look, this car's not. This is not oversteering. It's understeering." I said, it feels darty on the steering. It's got initial nervousness, but fundamentally it's understeering. We need to sit in the rear roll bar and get some more front wing on it. So I was just in and out of the pits for the session, really, just getting a balance on the car, to getting rid of the understeer that it really had, the, the basic understeer that the car had. And I said, look, we get this thing sorted. I think it's going to be good. Because for the first time I was in a car, I was, I was sort of keeping up with our cars down the straight rather than having a draggy old previous Tyrrell that, you know, you wouldn't even stay in the toe. So I thought, God, this is this could actually be quite good. And everyone was a bit more enthusiastic after the warm-up. And then the race warm-up lap, the rear anti-roll bar broke or something. So they had to fix that on the grid. And they fixed that. Um, and I, but I started from the back of the field. We had got between us the car to a state where actually it handled really well. We got rid of, because I was just in and out of the pits all the warm-up, I got rid of the understeer. I worked through the field and finished sixth. The transformation from despair from the whole team on the Saturday afternoon to almost euphoria on the Sunday. I mean, I don't think it did Michele's mood much, well, much good. What a, what a race. But that was one of my greatest achievements, yeah, frankly. I can see that. But how can two drivers have such an opposing view of what a car is doing? I think he'd expect it to be quick straight away. And when it wasn't, he hadn't thought carefully enough about really what it was doing and was just a bit... Because he was maybe it was a, he was on home ground. It was Italy, and you know he was expected to go well, and he wasn't. He just got in a bit of a flat spin and panic, and didn't think clearly enough about what the car was really doing, and was just too instinctive and didn't think it through carefully enough. You said earlier that you tended to overanalyze. It seems to me that analysis is what really helped you in that Imola race. It did absolutely. There were plenty of other things in my career. I mean, for example, like racing Group C sports cars with a picture of the Porsche 956. And an example, again, how I used to enjoy developing the car was that we were coming 1984, Brands Hatch Grand Prix circuit for the 1000K race up against the factory Porsches and everything else. Keith Green was the team manager. Jan Lammers, my teammate. I knew that with the Porsche, with those 956s, you could get loads of rear downforce. The rear wing was massive and wide and far back. It was always a problem getting enough front balancing it. And around Brands, it was it, Brands has got no real long straights. It's all about cornering speed. I said to the team before we went there, what's going to be the factor here is getting enough front grip out of this. Uh, if we can find more front grip, we can run more rear grip, which we can get easily, which is usually the problem, and it will be quicker. I said, so what can we do? And, and I said, why don't we just put another front wing on top of the nose? And good thing is that Richard Lloyd and Keith Green and Peter Stevens, the team were all very progressive. And if any, yeah, we, we, it was definitely, if you had a wacky idea, well, think about that. And what's the harm in trying it? 
So in the first practice at Brands with the, uh, in the, in the, for the 1,000K race, I said, right, we changed. We had another nose with the front wing on it. And um, I said, right, put the other nose on. So I did, I don't know, five laps to start with with the standard nose, did a time, completely put the other one on. And I said, yeah, this is definitely better. I said, right, came in after two laps, crank more front wing on. Yeah, another two laps. Yeah, better, but put some more front wing on. Put another angle on. Right, now got oversteer. Now put some more rear wing on. And I think we got pole basically by nearly a second just because we got so much we got a load more grip out of the car because we could run a load more rear wing because we could now balance it with the front wing so that was the kind of thing and actually went on to win the race at a canter of course you did you and Jan Lammers you're an intelligent driver you were an analytical driver probably not a surprise when you look at your background you're the son of a GP you qualified as a doctor how unlikely a story is it that you made it as a racing driver, given where you were age 16, wanting to be a doctor? I think it's very unlikely, to be honest. <laughs> you know, when, when I look at people going racing now, and uh, I mean, the world was so different then. I hadn't even sat in a racing cart. I didn't know what a racing cart was. My father was a GP. I badgered him to take me to some motor races. I was always passionate about cars and reading Motor Magazine at the time. But I had no family background in it at all. I took myself off and did the initial trial at Brands Hatch as a 17-year-old when a chap called Sid Fox took me around. I couldn't afford the single-seater bit, so it was just in one of those Shell Sport Ford Escorts. And I remember I've got, still got the little chit somewhere in the archives that says 91% too fast for first time, but lots of potential. <laughs> um, and then I, you know, and then I started. That, yeah. But my started as a racing. I went to, you know, 18 years old, I went to medical school and shared a house with um, a load of people, other students and people just qualified. One of the eight people in this house in South East London, because I was at Guy's in London, there was a chap called David Mercer who just qualified as a dentist and outside of the house, there was a, there was, he had got Jensen Healy. So here's was me arriving in my little old Hillman Imp, which I think I had at the time, to see this guy who just qualified as a dentist with his Jensen Healy. So I thought, right, he's just the person I need. So I persuaded him he ought to actually go motor racing. And we looked in the back of car, or I looked in the back of cars and car conversions and found a frog eye Sprite. The cheapest car that was anything that's going to be remotely affordable was this frog eye Sprite advertised down in Thanet in Kent for a £325 little Mosports car. So I sold my entire possessions of, uh, to raise £162. And we went down there and Dave put in his 162 and we came away with this frog eye sprite, which of course was a dreadful thing. It blew up straight away. And I had to, you know, I was running it off a student grant and rebuilding it and learning everything. After a few months, David said, look, I'm going to go and buy myself a proper little reliable MG midget. But, you know, you, you carry on with my money in that for a bit. So I, I ran that and that, but that's how I started. And that was an 18 year old in mod sports. And then it, you know, it was Formula Ford, but I, I, you know, I never had any money. And my father had no money to put into what I did. And it was just a question of, you know, of student grants, doing stuff, begging, getting a little token of sponsorship here and there all the way through my career. So clearly you were quick. At what point did it get serious for you? The serious bit was definitely Formula 3. But oh, as I, late as that? Yeah, well, I say, yeah, really, because I'd been racing as a medical student all the way. I'd done, so I'd done my year as with the Sprite then two years in with the Marcus, and then three years with Formula Ford. And now I'm getting to the point when I've qualified in medicine and I was going to go and do a GP training scheme because I thought that would give me the time and flexibility, knowing my father's lifestyle, to go and do some racing as a hobby. But then I thought, actually, I've really got to do this. I made the decision to stop medicine for a year, take a year off and try and go full-time motor racing. What did your parents make of that decision? No problem at all. My father had died the year before anyway, so he wasn't around to influence it. And my mother was fine with it. I think she knew I was so strong-willed. There was no point in her trying to... Follow your passions. Trying to, yeah, follow your passions, yeah. And I think the fact that I'd actually qualified, I think if I'd bailed before I had medicine before I qualified, I think she would have been a bit, you know, are you sure you're doing the right thing? So I took a year off. I had this sponsor, Mike Cott, West Surrey Engineering, a little engineering company in Ashford, Surrey. So I persuaded him, look, what we ought to do is go and buy, we ought to do Formula 3, Mike. You know, we've, we, I finished, I've won a few races in Formula Ford, finished third in the Champ p and Championship, but we need to go Formula 3. So I persuaded him to go and buy the Project 4 championship winning Formula 3 car that Dick Bennett's had run and won the championship with Stefan Johansson with, the Route RT3. He said, okay, we'll buy the car. And I said, right, we need a test. So we went down to Goodwood with a handover. Dick was running it. Stefan did a few laps. 
I jumped in first ever time in a Formula 3 car and it suited my technical style because I didn't have a lot of power, but it was ground effects and skirts and all that stuff. Within 20 laps, I was within a, within a tenth of a second of Stefan Janssen. We thought, right, okay, we're all pumped up now. We've got to go and do this. We are going to go Formula 3. So now we bought the car, got the sort of car sitting in a workshop. And I said, well, the guy we need to run it is Dick Bennett. Dick had gone back to New Zealand to run one of his uh, Kiwi mates, a chap called Dave Oxton, in Formula Atlantic down there. And he, he was done with, you know, he'd run Project 4 for Ron Dennis, but he was done with that. And he, was, he wanted to have a quieter life down in um, New Zealand. But I was on the phone to him every few days, every week. I said, look, Dick, come on, you've got to come and do this. We're going to have a great team. And I said, well, have you got any money? You haven't got any money, though, have you? I said, yeah, we've got enough. We've got enough. We've got Mike. He's going to sponsor it. And, uh, and, and eventually, after about a month of, of me harassing Dick, he said, okay, we'll come back and do it. Of course, when he came back, it was nothing like the picture I painted there. We had an old, what was called a Ford A-series, which was like a grown-up transit sort of a transporter, one mechanic, and it was, well, we're here. This is the team, Dick. He said, you're joking, you know. Where's the mechanics? Where's the stores? Where the work? And it, you know, it was, we were virtually running it out of a lock-up garage. But, you know, by that time he was here, so he was on the hook. Harvey Spencer came from one of his mates, um, and we got the team going. It was hand-to-mouth. The fortunate thing is, as ever, we did the first race. Testing went well. Did the first race, won the first race, won the next one, won the next one, the next, basically won the first four races. And we're leading the championship, and there's no way we could stop now. And But we still only had one engine. We didn't have a spare nose cone. What sort of doors open when you're on a roll like that? Does suddenly people start throwing money at you saying, hang on, Jonathan, yes, we will support you. We can to an see extent, you got- yes. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't say throwing money, but um, when I went to people to try and extract money, it wasn't just a blank no. Yeah. Some it's an t- easier sometimes, sell, isn't it? Sometimes. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, the, for, for the first thing was, of course, I, it put pressure on Mike Cox to try and find a bit more money to keep the team going and keep us running. But Mike kept saying, look, this is it, the last race, the last race. I mean, the number of times he said that in the year, I was just limping from race to race. And I resorted to things like, uh, like selling stickers. I had to think, or you, you may, you know, you're too young to remember, but um, a helmet sticker said, I'm backing a future British Formula One star, Jonathan Palmer. And I sold for a pound each, I think three and a half thousand of those through Autosport. So that got me through another race. But the odd person, you know, BP came in with a bit, just bits and bobs. But that whole season cost 57,000 pounds. And we, we finished the season with the same nose cone we started with. And what an amazing story. It was an amazing to story. To win the championship like that. And that put me on the map big time because then I was testing straight away into testing Formula One cars with um, McLaren, with Ron. Medicine had to take a back seat. Yeah, then I went back to my guy, who I'd, my, my GP trainer, who I said, look, I'm just going to take a sabbatical year off. I'll be back at the end of the year, but I just want to get this out of my system. I didn't want to kind of him to sort of deny me the opportunity of coming back. But then in a year, I did say, well, look, actually, thanks so much for keeping it open. But, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to come back to motor racing. But it put me on the map, but it also put Dick Bennett's on the map because that was the start of West Surrey Racing. And the following year, he had Kiki Mansilla driving. And then the following year, it was Ayrton. And West Surrey Racing, it all spawned from, frankly, me pulling him back, <laughs> extracting him. never under, looked back. Never, yeah, never looked back. Do you ever look back and think how different your life would be if you'd not done the motor racing thing and you'd stayed in medicine? No, not really. It's unfathomable. I have no idea what would have happened. It's been a hell of a journey and an exciting one. And um, it set me up for other things, really, too. And I was always determined that it should do. I, I, was, I, was, a big, I was a driver who never thought that my Formula One driving career was the, was the be-all and end-all of my professional career. It was always something that was, I was going to do to the best of my ability until I couldn't anymore. When I lost my drive after a Lacey came on the scene in 89 and basically blew me away. But then I've always looked to the next step. You know, I looked to the next step then, joining McLaren as with a very successful relationship with Ron Dennis on not just the Formula One test program. And I was, I was going to Japan once every month for 18 months for three days of going to test with Tyler Alexander on the Suzuka Test Honda test program, for example. And they were, they were vivid days as well. But also, of course, the F1 road car program, I was testing with that. But at the same time, then I thought I, could, I was conscious of keeping my name in the public eye. So I approached BBC about doing uh, uh, commentary for them, which is another long story. But um, that was six years of that. And of course, those two things. And then building my business, the Palmer Sport business, starting at Bruntingthorpe. And that sort of morphing in. I've always sort of looked for the next step, really, and see where I'm going to go 
trying to do the thing that I'm doing now the best I can, but with an eye on where it's going to go in the future. Do you see yourself as a bit of a wheeler dealer? I don't know that I'm a wheeler dealer because I mean a wheeler dealer is I sell things too. If you deal, you. I'm, I'm thinking I'm, of the stickers I'm more that of a, you sold in I'm a bit. I'm, I'm, yeah. I know what you mean. Yes, I mean basically I am. I've always managed to find a way to get to the next step. I and mean, when I built my Bedford circuit, I got the planning permission. I started the contractors working, but I hadn't got the money. I just knew somehow I'd get the money. It was really just going to depend on how much I had to give away of the business to get the money. So I guess I've always been quite brave with commercial decisions. You know, one doesn't go Formula One racing if you're not a risk taker, particularly in the kind of cars that we were running in those days. So whether it's physical or commercial, I don't mind taking a risk, but it's very much a calculated risk when you're doing it and an even more calculated risk in terms of management thereafter. I guess I've always had a tendency to sort of dream high, think high, commit myself high, and then work out how they put my effort into working out how the hell I'm going to get there and not fall on my face. You mentioned a couple of names I just wanted to follow up on. Jean Alessi, he comes in for the French Grand Prix in 89. Was it immediately obvious to you that he was a bit different? Yes, it was. And it was pretty devastating, really. I was in my sixth year of Formula One. I outperformed each of my teammates all the way through. I'd outperformed uh, Philip Alio, Hugh Rockengatter at Zach Speed, and Philip Streff was reasonable competition, Julian Bailey, and Michaeli, actually. You know, I was outperforming Michaeli, which has probably contributed to why, part of the reason why he left. So when this young, when Ken said, look, Michaeli's gone, I'm afraid, but we've got this young French Formula 3000 guy, Jean Alessi, coming in. First Grand Prix at um, Paul Ricard. I qualified sort of 14th or something or 12th or maybe I qualified 12th. I mean, the car wasn't bad around Paul Ricard at the time. And Jean, his first, just jumping into it, qualified 15th and about two, three tenths behind. And I thought, I mean, that's um, impressive. But what was even more impressive is that he came up, you know, he, you know, obviously he was in the motorhome and garage we were together and he was so full of praise for what I'd done, you know. And I remember thinking, God, why is this guy so astonished that I've been quicker I've been racing you know I'm you know I've been racing Formula One six years I'm highly experienced I'm bloody good and this bloke's thought as if I've just a newcomer coming in and the next race I don't know I was one place ahead or he was one place ahead of me and the grid at Silverstone and then thereafter he was two or three tenths ahead everywhere and but then I realized that he because Jean was somebody who just couldn't believe anyone could ever be quicker than him the way he drove a racing car was drive the wheels off it which he did and that was the wake up straight away. You know, this, this guy was somebody who just couldn't understand how anyone was quicker than him, basically. <laughs> um, but to be fair, Jean and I got on well that year. It would have been easy not to, but he was a straightforward guy. He was just bloody quick. I respected him hugely for that. He wasn't as analytical as me, but he got, you know, he got the job done and his racing was inspired people. And like when the following year at Tyrrell in the Phoenix sort of thing. And we still got on well now, actually. We have a, have a lot of mutual respect, I think. You said earlier on that Ken Tyrrell normally did three-year deals with his driver. This was year three, 1989, for you. So the combination of it being third year, a Lacey's pace, could you see the writing on the wall? Yes. At the start of 1989, I was looking in great shape. I got a pretty competitive car and I got a very highly rated teammate. And I ended up matching him and often beating Michaeli. To the point that the last race he did, I'd set the fastest lap at the Grand Prix in Canada. I'd outqualified him and I was running third until I basically crashed out at the, uh, at the last corner and hit the, the infamous wall um, after the deluge of rain came down that today would have had the safety car out and frankly the race stopped. But in those days, you just everyone just kept going and until there was a last man standing, he was still pottering around, but he couldn't even use full throttle down the straights. But anyway, I was in good shape. And actually, although I knew my Tyrrell tenure was coming to an end because my three-year stint was up, I was talking very seriously to uh, Jackie Oliver about joining Arrows for the following year and also McLaren as well. And, you know, I was, I was definitely one of those drivers who were on people's shopping list. But, huge but... The advent of John Alacy blowing me away for the second half of the season completely kicked the legs out from me. And, you know, I wouldn't say I went from hero to zero, but I certainly went to one of those people that was no longer having intimate conversations in motorhomes as I was in the first half of the season. And it was pretty clear that my Formula One racing days were probably going to be over, bar a fluke. I took it on the chin, you know, Alacy was quicker. He had the same kit as me. There's no doubt about it. I've never felt that he was being favoured anyway. 
And that's when, again, I started looking ahead and seeing you know, where was I going to steer my career now? And the idea of joining McLaren, Ron and I always got on very well. And he rated my test driving skills, rated my development skills, PR skills, all those sort of things. Yeah, okay. Ron probably thought, yeah, he's, he's not got the last couple of tenths of an Alessi, but you're still quick enough to help develop the cars and help with the programs. And so that was the route I then took. So you'd seen Alessi in 89 from the inside. You were able to look at his data. You then go and start working with Ayrton Senna. What was it that stood out about the great man? I had immense respect for Ayrton. He and I started Formula One the same year, 1984. He and I both come through Dick Bennett's, albeit he'd missed out Formula Two and gone straight from Formula Three to Formula One. And he was clearly a really intelligent guy. We used to chat quite a lot. Overall, he was just in another, you know, he was another league. I remember actually in, the, in one of the times that was definitely ego deflating was when towards the end of 83 in my second year of uh, being the Williams test driver, Frank wanted to put Ayrton in and test him in the car. So we, there was a test at Donington in the flat bottom car when I was testing and then Ayrton jumped in and the bloody bloke was half a second quicker. And it was a real blow. And that, but also that just contributed to the fact that you just had to have massive respect for the guy. His speed, his aggression, his ruthlessness, and his sort of surreal persona outside of the car. He was just in a different sort of elevated world. I, I had a huge amount of respect for him. You, you, you had to have. Flicking it on six years when I was a McLaren test driver, you know, I'd be pounding around Hungary or something for a day and a half doing a time and, you know, in the MP45, Ayrton would come in. First run he'd do, he'd match my time. Second run he'd do after another 10 laps, he'd be three or four tenths quicker. And he was just that, you know, he was just but quicker. Where was he generating the time? Like most people, the, the guys that are quicker tend to be quicker by being later on the brakes and carrying more speed into the corners. He was braver, his judgment was better. And it's all terribly fine line judgment of these sort of things. He had a very distinctive technique on the throttle he'd waver the throttle. Now, he could run with a slightly more understeering car, but by going on and off the throttle, he'd sort of slightly upset the rear end if he needed to get the thing balanced mid-corner by going on, off, on, off. It would just slightly destabilise the rear end whilst picking up the speed. You talk about his persona outside of the car. Did you ever see him let his hair down? Would you go and have dinner with him when you're pounding round Estoril for a week? Would you see him relax? Would you see the Senna from the Dick Bennett days. I never really saw Ayrton completely relaxed letting his hair down. I guess he did somewhere, but I wasn't a close enough friend for him to do it with me. I'd only see him around race meetings. We'd often talk helicopters, but he was always pretty intense. When he was talking in a debrief about the car when we were testing, it was classic Ayrton. He'd be thinking very carefully and everything he said was very deliberate and thought through, he was very careful what he said and analytical in his, his way too, and intense about what he said. And I think even when he was away, certainly to say to the extent I knew him, when he was away from the car, he was still, because he was at the track, was pretty serious. I mean, he was on flights going to Grand Prix and he'd be reading the Bible. I did want to quickly ask you about your time at the BBC being a commentator and how hard Imola 94 was for you given your links with Senna? I joined BBC in 91, I think it was. I'd finished racing. Although I hadn't sort of retired. I wasn't as emphatic as that, but I knew that, and I hadn't got to drive for the following year, and I knew that was pretty much the beginning of the end of my F1 racing career. But, um, you know, I continued with testing, with McLaren, with the racing with Porsche, with Group C, a bit of touring cars. I thought I could contribute to the BBC's TV programme. And so I wrote to the producer, Jim Reside, I said, look, you've got Murray Walker and James Hunt in your commentary team. I said, but, you know, I think I could contribute to the team, to the programme, doing some reporting from the pit lane about what was going on. Also doing a little cameo spot talking about a specific aspect of the cars or the racing. You know, it might be the tyres and what qualifying tyres are all about. It might be the setup, how that worked, a pit stop, what happens then, you know, these sort of things. So he sent me a nice you know, email back saying, or probably a fax in those days, to be honest, saying, look, thank you very much for your letter. Um, we haven't really got any time in the program to run anything more. We haven't got any budget. But look, if you would like to come up and have lunch with us, very happy for you to do that. So I went up. I think it was, it was Roger Moody and, um, and Jim Reside at the time. And I went up and had lunch with them at Hammersmith. 
armed with a list of 16 topics that I thought I could talk about across each of the Grand Prix with an expansion with the text, basically, of the first topic that I was suggested I was going to do. We went and had lunch and um, again, they said, look, nice you to come. And like we said, look, sorry, well, we haven't really got any time in the program and it wouldn't really work very well and I haven't got any budget to pay you. And I said, well, for what it's worth, this is the sort of thing I was looking at doing. And these were the topics, just so you can understand the scope of, uh, of how it might work out and how it could contribute to the program's development. There's a lot of fascinating technology here that people just don't understand. And if they understood it, they'd find it very interesting, I think. But it needs to be done very simply and straightforwardly. Here's an example of what I think I would do for the first program. By the end of the lunchtime, they said, okay, well, look, actually, we've, yeah, perhaps we will do this. So that's how it all started. Because I started in the pit lane, and then I had a phone call in, was it 92, 93, after, I can't remember which year it was now, from Mark Wilkin, who was the producer at the end of the program. I was up at Bruntingthorpe, actually, doing one of my corporate events. And he said, have you heard about James? And I said, no, what? He said, James has just died. What? Anyway, so um, obviously I lobbed in to try and be the commentator alongside Murray. And I then duly did take over, did the first Grand Prix, French Grand Prix, uh, which was terrifying. But anyway, I settled into it. But then, yes, I was commentating with Murray when Ayrton had his accident. It was one of those times for all of us, but particularly me, when it was so profound. I mean, for one thing, I knew from the accident, the body language just didn't look good at all. This didn't look like he was about to be climbing out of that car. And I, st I will never forget that little jerk of his head that he did sitting in that Williams after the accident. I was pretty aware that he was probably fatal. But at the same time, this was unfathomable. You know, Ayrton was like a god. You know, it can't happen to Ayrton. Yes, we'd had Roland Ratzenberger on the Friday, but I mean, Roland Ratzenberger, that was a sort of Simtech car and a back end, you know, driver, all sorts of reasons why. You know, people make mistakes, the car might have broken. It was another end of the whole of Formula One and its drivers and its, and its technology. But Ayrton Senna, you know, Williams, no, this can't be happening. It was dis almost disbelief. You, know, you knew it was happening, but it was very hard to believe that it wasn't some sort of bad dream. That was the sort of time, too, from a commentary point of view, from a professional point of view, that one just realized what a, com or reinforced what a complete pro Murray was. You know, his voice goes from the hysterical, and he's like, to, this is, you know, all the medical team are here, they're doing the job. Professor Sid Watkins is doing, da, 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 and then I would interject with a few bits, but it was a long old hour um, of us commentating. And actually, at the end of that, uh, the Grand Prix 2, it, it, I had to hang on to the end of the um, early evening for, I think, to do a link with Steve Ryder talking about Senna's death and um, clearly was announced by that stage and what happened and why and the impact. And I remember doing the interview for BBC for the news, I think it was, six o'clock news from top of one of the um, Imola Pitts buildings. At the same time I was testing for McLaren, I'd come out with McLaren on the McLaren jet and that was at Bologna Airport. And I said to Ron, look, you need me to get a schedule back. I will. And he said, no, no, we'll, we'll, we'll wait for you. You know, we'll. So then he arranged a helicopter to take me from Imola to Bologna. And I remember it's just me and the helicopter and the pilot taking off. We had a beautiful sort of sun setting evening. We lifted off at about 6.30. The track deserted. Everybody gone. Just a bit of litter blowing around. And it was one of the most surreal times of my life to be flying along in a helicopter with this massive impact of what had happened in the last three hours and how sort of almost world-changing it was. So we flew along with my mind sort of meandering elsewhere, flying over the track and um, got to the airport, flew around, and the helicopter dropped me off pretty much alongside the McLaren plane. As it did so, we circled over and unbeknown to the pilot of the helicopter, we swung around and landed beside Ayrton's plane, his jet. And that was another super profound moment, you know, thinking... They're the spoils of success, and he's paid the price of the sport that he committed to to have that success. And he wondered how long that plane was going to be sitting there um, as a bit of a legacy of the dangers of what he loved and what he committed to and what he got great reward from. Jonathan, what an incredibly powerful story that is. Thank you for a really enlightening chat. It's been such fun to catch up and work through your career we could talk all afternoon but I, I know you're a busy man and all good things have to come to an end but thank you very much for your time well it's been fun and uh, yeah i mean i think we've only touched on about two percent of <laughs> of the stuff i must get and write my book one day 
That's a book I definitely read, Jonathan. Please write it. I hope you enjoyed hearing from Jonathan as much as I did. He had to dash off to a meeting, so he didn't even have time to touch on his son Jolien also making it to Formula One with Renault. But what Jonathan did say was so interesting. And without John Alesi joining Tyrrell midway through 1989, what might he have gone on to achieve in F1? Thanks for your time, Jonathan. It was great to chat and see you again soon. Now, please send in your thoughts and stories about JP. Did you see him race? Did you hear him commentate alongside Murray Walker on the BBC? Have you attended one of his driving experiences with Palmer Sport? Well, let me know by the usual means at Tom Clarkson F1 on Twitter or use the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. Which, of course, brings me on to what you sent in after last week's show with Jackie Stewart. It's just incredible to think it's 50 years since he retired at the very top. Let's start with this from Dread Pirate Wesley. I was fortunate enough to watch Sir Jackie in person in 1970 or 1971 in Can-Am at Edmonton. He didn't win, but I was fortunate enough to meet him. As an adult, I now realise just how much strain was on him, but he was very gracious to this 12-year-old and he gave me his autograph. He asked me if I enjoyed motor racing and I told him I followed Can-Am and F1. He then asked what my favourite track was and I told him it was Monaco because it was so exciting to see him there. Since then, I've been a huge fan of Jackie and read or watch anything regarding him. Well, what a lovely story. Thank you very much for sending that in. Jackie seems to have time for everyone, which is incredible when you think of the demands on his time. Let's hear next from Cameron W. One of the highlights of going to the Long Beach Grand Prix every year was getting to talk to Sir Jackie Stewart. Always a gentleman, a class act from head to toe. Well, he is indeed. Thank you very much for that, Cameron. And finally, let's hear from Yashneen. It gave me goosebumps when Sir Jackie said, death was very popular at the time. I enjoyed listening to his pure love for the sport, which gave him courage to race, even when engulfed by tragedies. That takes a big heart. Sir Jackie is a legend. Well, thanks, Yash. You are articulating what so many of us feel about Sir Jackie. We'll leave it there for this week, but thank you to everyone who got in touch. And don't forget to send in your thoughts and stories about Jonathan Palmer in time for next week's show. And why not leave us a rating or a review and share this episode by using the hashtag F1 Beyond the Grid. One more thing before I go, the latest F1 Nation is out now. Damon Hill and I answer your F1 questions. Listen to that by searching for F1 Nation on your podcast app. Thanks very much for listening. F1 Beyond the Grid is produced by F1 and Audio Boom Studios. Until next time, keep it flat out.